Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Doctor in the House. I am Dr. Suleiman Juman, and I'm your host on Doctor in the House, the show that brings you the news, the views, and the interviews with local and international medical matters. Well, let's start with a little commentary. Well, West Indies cricket, is it on the up? We put in a very credible, creditable performance against England. Um, we won the Test Series. We tied with them and they won the Series. And remember, England is the number one team in the 50-over game. So we're not doing too bad. So let's deal with it one match at a time, but it seems that we are doing something right. Well, of course, Double G is the man who is on the tip of everybody's tongues, everyone's tongues, especially the Calypsonians. Gary Griffith is popular. He's working hard. Let's see if he can sort out things. But he seems to be getting into a little tussle with the Media Association of Trinidad and Tobago because he's kind of encouraging them, as he would I'll use, uh, that the media should be using positive things, doing the right things, um, not glorifying crime and criminals. Uh, maybe they can have a little discussion and see what's the way forward. And of course, I noticed Marshall, who is Marshall Monday today, he's donating, he has donated tickets to the police for their campaign. I don't know if you've seen the ads on the TV where they're stopping people and telling them they have to give them a ticket. But it's a good ticket for doing good things on the road, like movie town tickets and now March and Monday tickets. Interesting. Uh, congratulations to San Fernando. They've named a street after Professor Ken Fillmore, one of our legends of the steel pan who recently died. And of course, the politicians are blaming each other for partnering with criminals. I, I mean, I wonder if they would just sit down and talk to each other and see how they can improve Trinidad and Tobago, because heaven forbid, we don't want to become like what's happening in Venezuela. And there doesn't seem to be of any sign of the violence and the turmoil abating, because I think yesterday a truckload or a couple of truckloads of supplies were burnt at the border. Um, and you will be hearing a lot of talks from Mike Pompeo of the United States and President Maduro. Um, it's really a bad situation, but let's see what happens over the long run. But it's going to be interesting because I heard that even American warplanes and Russian warplanes are using Trinidad for their transit. Um, so we are going to be smack in the middle of everything. Anyhow, let's move on to the medical news. I noticed that there is a full stroke rehabilitation clinic in Tobago, and it has been, um, I think, organized by Dr. Gerard Antoine, and a, a physician from these parts who worked in the United States and is now back in Trinidad and Tobago. And in the clinic, he has a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, someone called a physiatrist. Now, first time I've heard of physiatrist. First time I've heard that term, but it does exist. And I think it, it sounds like it will be a very important person to have in our setting because we have lots of people with cerebrovascular disease and strokes. Uh, in that clinic, there's also a speech and language pathologist and occupational therapist. And it's based in, St. Jo Fort, in Fort King George in Scarborough. Well, we wish him all the best. And hopefully, as it develops, you can have a branch in Trinidad as well. I noted in the newspapers that a diabetic was fined $4,000 for possessing marijuana and growing and possessing marijuana for medical purposes. Now, I'm not defending it per se, but diabetics tend to have a lot of medical problems. They get uh, peripheral vascular disease. And if it continues, that's where the blood circulation to the lower leg um, gets lower and lower because of the diabetes, the high cholesterol, and the pain, the legs can become very painful, and also the nerves, what we call uh, neuropathic pain, can be significant. And I know in the United States and Canada where there's medicinal marijuana, um, this is being used for pain of all kinds of origin. So the issue of the decriminalization and legislation, like legalization of marijuana is a big topic. And I certainly think there are 
uses for the cannabinoid molecule in medicinal purposes. It has to be controlled, but again, that discussion is con ongoing. But the poor gentleman had to pay $4,000 in, uh, in fines. I noticed in Philippines, 136 people have died because of a measles outbreak. Now, this was partly due to vaccination fears. Now, for those of you who have children, you know that your children get the MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine when they're younger, so they are immunized against getting measles. Now, I, uh, I'm sure you've heard throughout the world there have been lots of scaremongering and, and, and most of it pretty much unjustified, saying vaccination can cause this and can cause that. But we have moved on over the past 100 years with getting rid and eradicating many diseases that killed and debilitated lots of people. The main thing is polio, the measles, the mumps, the rubella. Um, all those things decimated um, populations throughout the world. And the measles vaccine is very important. It's a highly contagious viral illness. And it doesn't only give you a rash. In some patients, you can get pneumonia and you can get an encephalitis. That's an infection of the brain. So avoiding or preventing measles infection is very important. So please make sure that your children are immunized against the measles, mumps, and rubella and all the other vaccines that are available. Another report coming out was that there was a death at the home for the aged. Um, it was alleged that an elderly citizen tried to cook and died of burns. And when they did an investigation, it showed a quite a squalid conditions and house of horrors in the area. I think it was in Arima. Now, this in itself is, is a, a issue that needs to be sorted out legally and whatever. But I think the bigger issue here is that Trinidad, like other, believe it or not, semi or first world countries is facing an epidemic of elderly folks who need to be taken care of. Remember, as you get older, you need to have special needs. You have a high risk of having Alzheimer's, high risk of having other medical problems, and you need a lot of care. Now, in the olden days, we had the, nu the nuclear family where the parents and children lived together. But now we have many, many households where the children have moved out and you have elderly parents alone by themselves and no one to take care of them. And we do not have the infrastructure um, to have decent houses and homes for the age so that they can be taken care of in a very um, professional and medical and ethical and moral way. And because of this, lots of people are putting up homes that provide in care which are not of the best standard. So this is something that each one of us need to look at and the government need to look at because I'm sure you all know in the United States, Canada, England, and other first world countries, there are a lot of housing stock and systems that elderly folk can live in so that they're treated with dignity and have good health care and are looked after very well. So it's something we need to look at. Now, there's another um, epidemic that we are facing that, again, we see it's happening and is something doing, is something being done about it? I'm not sure in a meaningful way. There's a rise in obesity among students in primary and secondary schools. And this was told to the Joint Select Committee on Social Services. And it was told by the Diabetic Association president that 50% of primary and secondary school students are obese and are at risk of developing diabetes. And this is the thing, the issue of children being obese and becoming diabetic, leading to diabet elder, uh, obese adults or diabetic adults with all the complications. And then we have the other epidemic of the elderly uh, not having facilities. I remember one of my good friends telling me that these things, we see it happening. And it's like a hurricane. It's coming, and we are sitting here, and there's nothing we could do about it. But I put it to you, there is something we can do about it. 
we can do something individually, we can do something as parents, we can do something as leaders in the society, we can do something as teachers, we can do something as politicians because we know all of these things can create problems and will create problems for the society in the long run. And we're talking also about the individuals who are going to be suffering. Uh, one bit of encouraging and good news is that there's a pancreatic cancer clinical trial that's going to be held in Trinidad and Tobago. The John E. Savga Foundation has coordinated so that Trinidad and Tobago will um, do a project in combination with Dr. Daniel Von Hoff of Phoenix, Arizona. And he's going to be working with a lot of prominent local doctors, Dr. Dalla Costa, Dr. Ravi Maraj, Dr. Karen Seeley, Dr. Kavi Kapilde, Professor Dilip Dan, Dr. Vinay Minocha, Dr. Brian Armour, Dr. Alexander Sinanan, Dr. Kelly Allen Mike, Dr. Dylan Narain Singh, um, looking at pancreatic cancer and see how we can establish what's going on and how we can find some way of managing and dealing with pancreatic cancer in a more meaningful and successful way because it is a very um, high mortality cancer and the surgery for it is quite significant um, and can cause a lot of morbidity. One very good thing I think of the study is that a lot of medical students are going to be involved as well and that's going to be a big part of the palliation and counseling and dealing with empathy and communication that is important in dealing with not only pancreatic cancer but cancers all from all types. One final medical story that's coming out of Venezuela. We see what's happening in Venezuela. We see the social turmoil, but what is happening to the healthcare in Venezuela? Well, at one point in time, Venezuela had a very, very high standard of healthcare where they had lots of different specialists with lots of different uh, surgical techniques and medical techniques and PET scanning. And now with the turmoil that's going on and foreign exchange being an issue, healthcare is being um, totally um, debilitated and the patient and the people of Venezuela are suffering. I saw a similar article coming out of Haiti that the, the healthcare in Haiti is also in a very poor way. Um, doctors have left, nurses have left, and they showed a hospital where one or two junior doctors were there and they had nothing to offer the patients. Apart from one or two broken down beds, they had no IV lines, they had no fluids, they had no drugs. And certainly that's not a situation that we would like any country to be in because healthcare is a human right. We take a short break and I'll be back with you in a little while. Medical assistance? Come check us out at Ultimate Medical Clinic. We offer a wide variety of medical treatments. Why live in pain and suffer with wounds and ulcers? Ultimate Medical Clinic also provides laser therapy for pain relief and wound healing. We also treat arthritis, knee, neck pain, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic foot sores, psoriasis, eczema, and many more health conditions. Call us today to schedule your appointment, 665-1188, or visit us at 111A John Street, Montreux, Shogonan. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an over-pumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screams for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life.
can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. Keep refreshed with Oasis Premium Purified Water. Now available in more thirst quenching options. 330 ml, 600 ml, 1.5 liter, and 5 liters. Choose the size that fits you best. Grab one today. Need medical assistance? Come check us out at Ultimate Medical Clinic. We offer a wide variety of medical treatments. Why live in pain and suffer with wounds and ulcers? Ultimate Medical Clinic also provides laser therapy for pain relief and wound healing. We also treat arthritis, knee, neck pain, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic foot sores, psoriasis, eczema, and many more health conditions. Call us today to schedule your appointment, 665-1188, or visit us at 111A John Street, Montreux, Shogona. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an over-pumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screams for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. with Oasis Premium Purified Water. Now available in more thirst quenching options. 330 ml, 600 ml, 1.5 liter, and 5 liters. Choose the size that fits you best. Grab one today. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an over-pumped balloon. 
Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screams for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. Need medical assistance? Come check us out at Ultimate Medical Clinic. We offer a wide variety of medical treatments. Why live in pain and suffer with wounds and ulcers? Ultimate Medical Clinic also provides laser therapy for pain relief and wound healing. We also treat arthritis, knee, neck pain, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic foot sores, psoriasis, eczema, and many more health conditions. Call us today to schedule your appointment, 665-1188, or visit us at 111A John Street, Montreux, Chagot. Welcome back to Doctor in the House. Well, I know it's carnival time, so some of you are relaxing, listening to the music and stuff, but for those of you who are watching Doctor in the House, this is stress relief time. Well, this chap was working on the job, right? So he, ha he had an electric saw, and he actually accidentally cuts off all his fingers. So at the emergency room, the doctor says, all right, give me the fingers, and I'll see what I can do. The injured man said, but I don't have the fingers. The doctor said, but why didn't you bring them? The man said, I couldn't pick them up, doc. <laughs> so... <laughs> So a mechanic noticed that his co-worker was drinking brake fluid for lunch. Hey, what? somebody asked him, what are you doing? You can't drink that stuff. The man said, relax, relax. The stuff tastes pretty good, and I don't drink it all the time. The other mechanic said, seriously, that brake fluid is poison. You know? The man said, back off, back off. I can stop anytime I want break through it. <laughs> All right, last one, last but not least. A woman gets on a bus with her baby and the bus driver said, oh my God, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. The woman walks to the back of the bus and sits down fuming, she's angry. So she says to the man next door, that driver just insulted me. The man says, no problem. You go up there and tell him Go on, I'll hold your monkey in the meantime. <laughs> we take a short break and I'll be back with you in a little while. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an overpumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screams for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife a partner for people, for life. Need medical assistance? Come check us out at Ultimate Medical Clinic. We offer a wide variety of medical treatments. Why live in pain and suffer with wounds and ulcers? Ultimate Medical Clinic also provides laser therapy for pain relief and wound healing. We also treat arthritis, knee, neck pain, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic foot sores, psoriasis, eczema, and many more health conditions. Call us today to schedule your appointment, 665-1188, or visit us at 111A John Street, Montreux, Chagona.
Welcome back to Doctor in the House. Um, today we have a very special topic, something dear to my heart. And World Hearing Day is going to be um, commemorated on March the 3rd. And I think it's very appropriate that we talk about hearing, we talk about hearing problems, we talk about what can be done about hearing. So I have very, three very special guests. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Austin Trinidad, one of the, uh, what can I say, the patriarchs of otolaryngology, ENT surgery in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Debbie Pinder, also a very renowned ENT surgeon with who has an interest in audiology. Uh, we have Ms. Koshiba Lafleur, um, the ex Chief Executive Officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Association of the Hearing Impaired. So, everybody knows Dr. Trinidad. So, Austin, what have you been doing since you've retired from the public service? Well, basically, um, just enjoying what I always enjoy doing which is basically seeing patients who have ENT problems. And so I'm in my private practice now. So, so retirement doesn't mean you stop contributing? No, I still continue my practice. Very basically good. just to keep active. Very good. Uh, Dr. Pinder, you're an ENT surgeon uh, with a special interest in audiology. So explain to us, why did you go that way? You're, you're probably the only ENT surgeon in the Caribbean who really has that sub-specialization in audiology. Well, I, I just found it very interesting and... Um, First of all, what is audiology? Audiology is the science of hearing, study of hearing, and um, hearing loss. Um, and it's an, an, an area that is, you know, I think not very well um, served in the population. Yeah, I agree um, with you. And I thought, you know, and I, I always liked it, and um, that was something I was interested in doing. Good. So, Ms. Lafleur, tell us about yourself. Where are you from? Um, I live Shagonis now, but I, I started with the association like about two years ago. Why? Because I have a deaf son. My son is deaf. He's 20 years old now. Um, since he was about 11 or 12, I started working actively with the community of the deaf. Um, and um, thought it necessary for me to be involved in that particular area. And then I was just um, temporarily appointed as the executive officer since 2016. I'm still, I'm still there. Excellent. So, um, yeah. so tell us now, for the 99.99% .99 of people out there, what is the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Hearing Impaired? Well, it's the association that is responsible for assisting with persons who have hearing loss. So if you have any, um, like you have hearing loss, we, you come there, we test you. Um, we also fit you with free hearing aids. The hearing aids are provided through a subvention grant from the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we do testing, we also do ABR testing, thanks to the Ministry of Health, who loan us their machines. Um, and we do that with babies. We um, also, is the association responsible for supporting and working at providing more resources and services for deaf and hard of hearing persons in the society. Oh, good. Excellent. So it is a, a government agency as such, is it? No. What is it? What uh, do you it's, call it? It's um, an independent NGO supported by government Support. because of the service that we provide okay. to the general population All when right, it comes great. to hearing loss. All right. Let's get down to some nitty gritty. Dr. Trinidad, tell us a little bit of the mechanism of how people hear. So a sound is made. How do people hear it? Well, as you know, sound travels in waves, which are called sound waves. And they enter your ears. Um, and your, your ears, really, the structure of the ears is, is, is structured in such a way that it catches these waves. Um, they go through the canal, and the sound waves strike your eardrum or tympanic membrane, as we call it in anatomically, it then vibrates, and the eardrum is now attached to three little bones in the middle ear. As you know, the ear has three parts, an external part, which is the canal. Then you have a middle part, which is a chamber, a little chamber, which contains air and these three little bones, which we call ossicles. 
and then you have the inner ear, which contains the business part of the ear that uh, is responsible for receiving the sound waves. So the sound waves are transmitted by the little bones in the middle ear to the inner ear through a window that we call the oval window. And the vibrations, which are mechanical to begin with, the sound waves turn into mechanical vibrations. And that ch changes into a wave in the fluid in the inner ear. Now, the inner ear has two parts to it. There's the part that deals with balance, and these are the semicircular canals. And then the part that we are interested in, or we're going to be talking about now, uh, is the cochlea. And the cochlea is like a snail shell and contains fluid. And it has basically three chambers, an upper, middle, and lower chamber. And not to get too technical, but it contains hair cells, uh, or neurological cells, nerve cells, which have little hair endings, hair which are disturbed by sound, the sound wave. So when the wave passes through the fluid in the cochlea, it distorts the, 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 the hairs on the neurological endings. And this produces an electric current. So we have sound waves, which are initially mechanical in, in nature, are converted into electrical impulses. And those electrical impulses go up the nerve of hearing to the brain. And that's how we hear. I mean, I've always been fascinated of the, the intricacies of the air and the balance mechanism, you said. I find it so fascinating. So in terms of how do you classify, in simplest ways, hearing loss? All right. So we have two types of hearing loss. One is where uh, your ear func functions very normally. The nerve of hearing is perfectly normal. The reception is normal, except the sound is not getting there for some reason. Um, and that's one of the most common causes of hearing loss, and that is a blockage in the ear. And the simplest one would be just impacted wax. Our oh, good friend, Q-tip. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Everybody uses Q-tips. Uh, people love to put Q-tips in the ears after showering. Uh, and then they wonder why they, they're blocked up. They say, I clean my ears all the time. But you're not. You're actually working against the ear. The ear is a self-cleansing organ. It cleans itself. Uh, and when you use Q-tips, you work against the, the mechanism and you push the wax back in and impact it. So that's what we call conductive hearing loss because the, there is no conduction of the sound waves across that passage because there's a blockage there. The second type is where there is no blockage. However, there's something wrong with the end organ. The end part of the ear, which is the nerve of hearing, has become damaged and the most common damage, the one we'd like to talk about this evening, is noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, and this is um, something that very, is very unfortunate because it can be prevented. Uh, and uh, so we like to bring the message this evening of what loud sounds noise, what noise basically does to your hearing. But maybe you can bring in Dr. Pinder now. Tell us a little bit about World Hearing Day. How, how did that come about? Well, it's an initiative by the World Health Organization, and it started in 2015, I believe. And it's really, it, it was really there for, because of the challenge of increasing prevalence and incidence of hearing loss. So right now... Um, so let's the, clarify that to the public order, sure. the incidence of hearing loss is increasing. That is correct. Yeah. Um, and the WHO has said, World Health Organization has said, has estimated that 466 million people worldwide have hearing loss. And they have also um, saying, which is alarming to all of us, is that 1.1 billion young people are at risk of hearing loss due to noise exposure in recreational settings. So we are looking at a younger population, more and more, 
um, getting hearing loss from a younger age group, and that has a lot of implications in, 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 in several ways. It's, you know, when you have hearing loss, it affects your life, it affects your career choices, it affects so many things. So, um, and they estimate that this 4.6, 4 466 million, that's going to increase. By 2030, it's going to just, just increase and increase for several reasons, apart from us, you know, um, exposing ourselves to a lot of damaging noise. But of course, as you get older, your hearing tends to deteriorate and, and so on. So really what we are trying to do is trying to just sensitize everyone about the preventable, as Dr. Austin said, the preventable, these preventable causes of hearing loss. So let's talk a little bit about that. How does noise cause a hearing loss? Okay, so what happens when you have loud noise? It now, now, first of all, we've got to define what is noise, eh? Right. Well, okay, loud sound, oh. I should say, yes. Because noise is any, any sound that you don't want to hear. So loud sound of any kind of sound um, can damage the inner ears. Dr. Austin was saying, in the cochlea itself, there are these hair cells um, which are the cells that actually change wave mechanical energy into electrical energy. And those cells are very, very important. And those cells as well help us hear very clearly. So when, what happens with the noise? Um, when you're exposed to noise, those cells become um, drained, they become damaged in several ways, and they may die, they may get they may just not function very well and may come back a little bit, you know, to function, but some of them may die. So when you're exposed to loud um, levels of noise, you can get something called, for example, a temporary shift, where you notice if you're exposed to a really loud noise, um, a party, or you go into a church function, or any kind of function when there's really, really a lot of loud sound, you may come out, you know, you're not quite hearing well or you're hearing this ringing in your ear. That's your ear telling you that you have done some kind of damage. Now, sometimes, maybe within 24 hours, you may find that the noise has gone, or you may find that your hearing loss has improved and you think it's come back to the normal level it was before. I think I've had that once, and it's very frightening for those one or two days when you're not sure if your hearing is going to come back. Right. And, and sometimes it doesn't, you know? For some people, it doesn't. Um, so that is really that that is really your ear giving you giving you information. Look, you are you are damaging yourself, and really we need to, to take heed of that. Right. Let's talk about in our society. What are the kind of songs we are looking at as possible causes of noise in your hearing loss? Any loud sound. So you have the recreational, the, the, you know, if you, for example, loud music, it, you know, which is very topical now, listening to amplified music, very, very loud sounds. If you have very, for example, hobbies, you can be a hunter, um, you know, you can go and shoot on the range, you can go and do um, water sports on a boat. Um, so they are very, very sometimes noisy hobbies. But even within the house, vacuuming, if you do, you know, any sort of loud machinery. If you're in the garden, whackering, if you're doing any of those using power tools, those um, mechanical devices can give out very, very loud sounds that could damage your hearing and can damage it permanently. Right, so Kachiba, now the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Hearing Impaired is involved in a program right now. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's a protected hearing campaign that we started last year. Um, it was out of Dr. Pandey suggesting that we sensitize the public. No, Dr. Pandey, right? Not Basdi Pandey. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pandey. Who works one. at Dretchi? He works at Dretchi. He's one of our audiologists. Um, he suggested that in 2018 that we do some sort of sensitization to the general public around carnival time. He thought that was necessary because after carnival, there's always a spike in testing at the association. And when we investigate, it's mostly persons who would have been involved in carnival activities, so like um, pan players, the musicians, sound engineers, party goers and those things. Um, so in 2019, we thought, we, in 2018 was okay because we just did some online stuff, but in 2019 we wanted to widen it a bit. So we were having conversations with Ministry of Health, Reference World Hearing, they already 
Um, and when we spoke, when I spoke to Dr. Pinda, she thought it was, you know, it's an amazing idea just for us to merge everything together. So we did that. We were speaking with Ministry of Social Development as our line ministry as well. And they thought it's a really good idea to be a part of the campaign as well, to just help in sensitizing and raising awareness. And then we had other parties joining, Quota International, Red Cross, and a couple of others join on board of the campaign to help raise that awareness of the loud sound exposure and how that can affect one's hearing. Yeah, I remember, um, but a few years ago, I built on the work of Dr. Kurovilla and Dr. Aziz and did a research on Exodus Steel Band. Mm -hmm. This was about 10 years ago. And in the engine room, at the iron section, mm -hmm. There was a significant incidence of hearing loss within that group, um, and I think I heard when Dr. Pinder was on the radio show the other day. All, purely all musical endeavors, there are some incidences like symphony players, um, rock bands. So, Dr. Trinidad, how did well, how do you? Tell patients, how do, what kind of information you would give patients in terms of preventing this? Well, I see two types. As you say, at this time of, of the year, we see a lot of people who've been to carnival functions and have come in. I just had one this, this, this morning, um, a lady who went to a carnival fete and um, she found that she was, her hearing had become muffled. Mm -hmm. And that's a typical uh, instance of downward shift of the threshold of hearing um, and uh, hopefully it will be temporary and uh, it will return um, but sometimes it doesn't um, so unfortunately we don't see people before it happens uh, or very rarely uh, so we'd like to get the message across that if you're going to a FET which is almost certainly going to be some, some uh, degree of loud sound, um, your e ears are at risk and you should protect them. Now, uh, I think Dr. Pinder is going to show you what you can use to protect your ears, um, but any kind of earplug or Defender. Well, maybe Debbie, you can yeah. go through some of this stuff that you have. Uh, yes, but you know, um, we have a, a saying, uh, we do several things. I just want to just make a little plug for children especially, because um, you can use, certainly there are special earplugs for young children and so on, but it's not readily available. So really, what we want to do with noise we want to, one, turn down the volume. So for example, in young people, they use earbuds and they may turn up the volume. Those things can really, really, over time, can give you um, this kind of noise-induced hearing loss. So the first thing we say is turn down the volume. The second thing we say is walk away from the noise. So for example, if you are, don't go near the speaker. Just, go, just walk right away from the loud noise. And the third thing is if you have to be in noise, then you try to wear hearing protection. Okay, yeah, you have some... Right, so there are two sets, two types of hearing um, protection, uh, protective devices. There's the earplugs and there is earmuff, the, the earmuffs. So, and the, and the earplugs, you have, again, you have disposable ones. So, for example, this is not a very good one, but I'll just show you. This is, for example, a foam earplug. This tends to be um, one use. This is, um, you know, just a single use. Um, and this is a type of earplug that you could just put in. And, um, you, you know, once you're finished with it, really, you really have to dispose of it. But for those of us who are going partying all the time, what might be helpful is something like a reusable earplug. Okay, so this, for example, is an example of a reusable earplug. And you can put it in, you can take it out, you can clean it, put it in a case, and use it again. So if you're going to a lot of events, this is something that you can and use. And those readily available in They land. are. They are. So for example, last weekend, I bought these at a drugstore. I wouldn't say which. <laughs> but for example, this was $24.99. And this is a reusable earplug. Um, this one is the foam, which is the one single use. And this um, was, I think, they're all between like 20 and $40 a pair. 
So if you're ready, going back and forth, uh, you know, maybe the reusable one mm -hmm. is, is the good one to have. Yeah, I must say, after my study and uh, looking at some of the steel pan players, I see more and more people have um, plugs in their air. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, um, and uh, it doesn't reduce your enjoyment because it, it just mm -hmm. attenuates the sound mm -hmm. to a safe level. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's the important thing. Yeah. So it's not that you're blocking off the sound completely. You can still enjoy the music, and, and but it's just attenuated to a safe level. Now, the, the, apart from the single explosive sound that can damage your air, there are occupational issues as well. So people who work in very loud um, environments, uh, and they go to work every day, every day, every day, and without he using hearing protection, they can get progressively a noise-induced hearing loss. And that's why most of the big companies will have occupational and safety um, groups controlling that, doing screening, doing um, hearing protection. I want to go back to Kashiba. <coughs> Tell us a little bit about Dretchy. What does Dretchy stand for? <clears throat> it's Diagnostic Research Educational Therapeutic Center for Persons Who Are Hearing Impaired. Um, it's actually the clinical arm of the association, so that's the department within the association that is focused on the hearing tests and the hearing fitting. That's where our social workers function out of, our speech and language therapists, hearing aid technicians, all the clinical and technical staff work within the director department. So, I mean, I would think that you all probably see most... Uh the biggest percentage of hearing impaired people in Trinidad and um, Tobago. Yeah, um, we <coughs> see a lot of persons with hearing loss besides those who may be deaf and hard of hearing and all that. Um, it's like most people complain when they call Drachi, they don't get us on the phone. It's because the phones are constantly ringing. So we have two persons only working the front desk right now. We're hoping to improve on that soon. And um, while they're on the phone, then they sometimes have to deal with clients that are in their faces. So sometimes it's difficult to answer the phone and deal with a client. Somebody always feels they're left out. But um, we see a lot of people, our um, appointment listing is like long months in advance. And most people think when they come there, because you're referred by the hospital or something, you know, it's I supposed to get through one time. And we have to always explain, no, it's not like that, because there are other people waiting ahead of you. Yeah. Uh, do you have a branch in South at all? Or? No, the board actually had a brief discussion about that recently. We have a new board um, effective of November last year, and they actually made mention of something like that. It's something I'm looking into as well, because um, not just South, but Tobago, they both left out mm -hmm. a lot, and we have to find ways of just spreading um, the arm a little more, because it's the free hearing aid part of it. So most persons, is, you know, it's a challenge for them to travel from rural areas to get all the way down to Port of Spain. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to look at options like that, or just have a mobile unit which the Ministry of Social Development is also looking into to support. Yeah, I remember when I worked in England at the NHS, uh, this thing about hearing aids, they, they get free hearing aids in England. And I think a study was done, I don't know, Debbie and Austin, if you know about that, that they found, the place where they found most hearing aids were in the top drawer. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That people right. got it and just packed it away. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always a tricky thing. You, mm -hmm. you don't force people to have areas. They yeah. have to really desire to want it. But that's a good point, Solly, because what I think is not, people don't understand, especially with noise induced hearing loss, is that a hearing aid is not going to correct the problem. Mm -hmm. So that if you have this kind of inner ear hearing loss, you if a hearing aid is not going to bring back your hearing perfectly. It's not, it does not work like eyeglasses, where you put on a pair of eyeglasses and you see clearly. It's not like that at all. All right, folks, so we're talking about the ears, the hearing loss. We're talking about audiology. We're talking about Trinidad and Tobago Association of the Hearing Impaired. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to open up the telephone lines for you all to talk to our esteemed guests and see how we can give advice or help. See you in a little while. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an overpumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screens for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. 
Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. Need medical assistance? Come check us out at Ultimate Medical Clinic. We offer a wide variety of medical treatments. Why live in pain and suffer with wounds and ulcers? Ultimate Medical Clinic also provides laser therapy for pain relief and wound healing. We also treat arthritis, knee, neck pain, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic foot sores, psoriasis, eczema, and many more health conditions. Call us today to schedule your appointment, 665-1188, or visit us at 111A John Street, Montreux, Shogonan. Hi, this is Dr. Suleiman Juman, and I'm your host and doctor in the house. And tonight we're talking about hearing loss. Uh, we have Dr. Austin Trinidad, Dr. Debbie Pinder, and Ms. Kashiba Lafleur uh, of the Trinidad and Tobago Association of the Hearing Paired. What we're going to do now, we're going to open up the telephone lines um, so you can bring, get your questions in. Remember when you're patched in to the, the front here, put your television on mute because we get a very bad feedback. All right, so the line, my producers are putting the lines on the screen right now, so feel free to call. Uh, Kashiba, the Association for the Hair Impaired, there are a few activities that they are involved in right now. Well, we're part of the campaign now, so we're going out into, well, as we partner with the other ministries, we have a booth at the Savannah right now that we're managing for the rest of the carnival season. We're going out into secondary schools, um, and UTTs and UEs, stuff like that, to raise more awareness of the entire initiative. Uh, we also went out to like Red Cross over the weekend. We, on Saturday, there was Red Cross Kiddish Carnival, and we distributed like a thousand earplugs. One of the important things is that persons, everybody, almost 90% of the people we distributed to said, I know how to use the earplug. And then when you see them using it, it was just like sticking out to the air. And you know that they did not know. So we have these brochures that we give out along with the airplug. It's an instructional brochure giving you a guideline as exactly how to insert it. But then they're reading those things. So it's, um, we did an interview this morning on one of the television stations giving a demonstration of how to actually use the airplugs. I hope some people did look at it and have an idea of how to do it now. Well, that's the problem. Young people think they are invincible. It's not young people alone. Well, <laughs> not young people alone. <laughs> So Debbie, you're telling me about the, when you're wearing, getting these plugs, you need to look for specific things. Right, yes. So the, on the air plug itself, uh, the, usually marked somewhere would be something called a noise reduction rating, and it gives you an idea of the sort of levels. It, it's not absolute, but the sort of levels and protection that you would get while you're using the air pro properly. Now, if you don't, as Ms. Lafleur said, if you don't use the earplug properly, you're not going to get very much protection. Um, and usually at the back of the, of the package would be some kind of instruction on how to use it and how to use it properly. Because remember, especially with the foam earplugs, if you don't use them properly, you actually may get, be getting the same amount of noise um, that you're trying to, you know, to, to prevent from going into your ear. Now, also you, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these, not only youngsters, but the walking around with these earbuds um, in their ears. Um, producers, do we have any calls on the line? Um, yes. Um, sir, do we have any calls on the line? Hello? Hello, good night. Yeah, good night, Doctor. Hi, go ahead. Yeah, this question is for any one of the one of the panel there. All right. Is hearing loss um, caused by sustained noise or shock of bullets, for example, firecracker or gunshot? At least not yet. Oh, brilliant question. Thanks for calling. Austin? Well, that's the pulsatile noise induced hearing loss. That's just one um, instance of, of hearing loss. It can be, so it's an instant 
n noise pressure that causes damage to your inner ear. Um, the, the other type, of course, is chronic exposure to noise, yeah. which mostly happens in the workplace. Uh, if you're working in a noisy environment where you don't have and you're not using any kind of protection. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, with fireworks, um, we see it a lot in people who uh, use... It's those scratch bombs. I've seen a few yes. people, people are standing up yes, right. and somebody throws a scratch bomb That's by the right. ear and they lose yes. hearing. Yes, and not, it's not only your hearing that is damaged, very often people get uh, dizziness, vertigo, and a ringing in the ear, something we call tinnitus. So they get all these three things. Um, and uh, so that's the delicate part of your ears being, being damaged by this extreme sudden noise, instant noise pressure. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, but the other group which I see are policemen or the armed forces armed who force. have to do shooting. Shooting on the range, and yes. And believe it or not, some of them do not wear air protection. Mm -hmm. That is a recipe for disaster. So anybody who is a hunter, anybody who has to go on a shooting range, they must wear air protection. And Debbie, what, what would you recommend right. for, for those patients? So I, again, if you have a, a high-powered rifle or you're shooting with very, very loud noises, I would suggest double protection because studies are not clear in terms of Was how... Was that a condom or...? <laughs> Tell us what double protection you're so talking about. You can use both, both an air plug and an air muff. Generally, the, um, the air muffs um, would be, you know, fairly... This, for example, has a noise reduction rating of 27 or 28, um, but I would suggest um, that you can use um, both an air plug as well as an air muff um, when you're on the shooting range. Um, so because, again, as Dr. Austin, uh, Dr. Trinidad suggested uh, and said, it's really, really a very loud noise. Um, you know, some, these firearms are in the, in the order of 120, 130, 140 decibels, sometimes more, depending on the, the, the right, the bow, you know. And so they can really give intense pressure there in the air. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's best to be safe than, than sorry. And we keep repeating all of this is preventable. And the majority of these, when they're exposed to the loud sound, some can be temporary, but a lot of them are permanent. Just be aware of that. All right, so good call. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Hello? Yes, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, good evening. Good evening. I suffer with tinnitus for a few years now. OK. I don't know what caused it, but uh, now my daughter, my younger daughter, she's telling me that she has been a ringing in her ears too. And now the mother also are getting a ringing in the ears too. We don't know what causes this. Is there any cure for it? All right, good any question. That could correct it or what? Very good question. I'll put that over to Dr. Debbie Pinder. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Pinder, <laughs> what is tinnitus? Tinnitus is just a, set, a perception. You, 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 you hear something in your ear or your head when there's nothing in outside that's obviously causing that sound. So for example, if you, you hear a ringing, but there's nothing in the room that's ringing or buzzing or whatever. So that's all tinnitus is. It's a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. So there are many causes of tinnitus. So first of all, really, you need to have to find out what is causing the tinnitus. So there are two types of, you know, what tinnitus, we, types of tinnitus, you would have what we call subjective and objective tinnitus. So an objective tinnitus is a you know, sort of big word. It means that somebody else can hear the sound. <coughs> and usually that is from something in the air or in the head. So for example, some people have a little a click in the back of the throat, and maybe the doctor, Dr. Trinidad, if you go to Dr. Trinidad, he would be able to hear it. Or you may feel you know, that there's something there, and you can actually, or um, he can hear a, something, a, 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 a pulse, pulsating sound in the neck, and that's what you're hearing. So first of all, you have to really find out what is causing the tinnitus. Um, but of course, um, I'm not, so, so that's the main thing that one has yeah, to do. But the majority, unfortunately, of tinnitus mm -hmm. 
the ones that you can, nobody else can hear but you. And that, that's the problem. Um, the commonest cause of tinnitus by far and large is age. And the, the analogy I try to tell patients, uh, you remember those old time Philips radio? After a while, it starts to crackle. That's because the electrical <laughs> wire is degenerating. Unfortunately, the nerve of hearing is like an electrical wire. And as you get older, it does start to degenerate. Your hearing starts to drop, and you start to hear this noise. Now, as you said, there are younger people who will get the noise. And yes, they need to be investigated. You need to, uh, there are other things that can cause it. There can be a virus kind of be attacking the nerve. Sometimes you can be an autoimmune disease where your body's producing chemicals. So there are things that we can do to assess. Um, but unfortunately, tinnitus is a common, common problem throughout the world. And once we assess that there's nothing serious going on, we can do things to try to help you cope with it. And one of the things when you have tinnitus, silence is your enemy. You always need to have a little bit of a background sound. Say, for example, you're going to sleep, you have a radio on, or I know when I go off to the meetings in the States, they sell CDs of breeze blowing, of waves, so you can put that in the background so that it takes up the sound, what we call attenuation. The important thing about most causes of tinnitus is that it is not life-threatening. It does um, cause a little bit of a quality of life issue, but if you keep busy, you control your sugar, your pressure, your cholesterol, keep active, keep exercising, um, do the, all the other things, it's not going to kill you. It, it, but you can manage it, and you go ahead and you live uh, a full life. But you need occasionally to have some investigations to make sure it's nothing serious. All right, we have another call on the line. Hello? Hello, good evening. Good evening. Hi, go ahead. Is this doctor in the house? That's it, you're on. Okay, I'm Mr. Singh, I live in Tagarigua. Uh huh. What has happened? We live uh, almost opposite two bars on each side of my house. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the music is so loud, it affects you. You can't even watch the television in front, you have to go to the back. Yeah. And it goes on like for a whole day sometimes. I uh, wonder if that, would this have any effect on the state or All right, thanks very much. That's, I think it's a very important question because um, I don't know if Dretchy is involved, but this, is a, this really is an issue for EME. That's right. And Austin, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, I used to be associated with EMA for a short while. Um, and they, in fact, have um, noise meters, noise, um, what do you call them? Sound level. So, so, yeah, sound level uh, meters. meters. And what they can do is go outside your house and, and measure the level of sound that is emanating from these institutions, uh, establishments. Um, and noise pollution uh, can be um, dealt with by the environment. I don't know how effective they are. I think that's, that is probably <laughs> the big issue. Yeah, you know, they, they may say yes, that, that that's the case and so on. Um, because if you are in a residential area, you are supposed to get some kind of uh, dispensation from the environment EMA to play loud music. Uh, so that, which means that you can only do it sometimes if there's a certain occasion, certain party going on and so on. Um, but you can't have it on every night because that is, a, that is nuisance value. Um, so the EMA should be involved. Um, so that's it, the legal part of it. From your point of view, the question of whether it will affect your hearing, it's unlikely to be affecting your hearing. But what is pro it's going to be as significant is the nuisance and irritant value. Your blood pressure is going to go up. Your anxiety level is going to go up. You're not going to be able to sleep and it will affect your health in the long term. And of course, the issue here is this is your neighbor. Um, do you go to the police? Do you go to the EMA? How aggressive do you get? And I can't say that I know 
an easy answer, but I certainly think your EMA is probably the first port of, po port of call, and also maybe talking to the police. But uh, the question is whether those bars uh, should be in a uh, residential area. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, you can't be more definitive than that, but I, 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 I can feel your pain. All right, we have another caller. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening. You're on air? Yes, good evening. Um, Doctor in the house? Yes, you're on air. Yes, to the panel. Yes. I found that the sirens and the protective services, particularly police, is particularly loud. And since it is that you can't stand up waiting on them to pass, hearing the noise, what would you recommend that one does? All right, that. Many people, you see them when they serve the spouse, they mm -hmm. put their fingers in their ears mm -hmm. to prevent the noise mm -hmm. from affecting them. What would you recommend? All right, well, I, I see Dr. Pinder empathizing with you, so maybe she can give mm -hmm. us some advice. Yes, and sirens generally about sometimes between 120 to 140 decibels, they're very loud. And I think that is a very good thing because you don't have, if you, I, I do it, I put my fingers in my ear and I wait until it goes away. And similarly, if you have young children, I would advise you do the same, try and protect them as well. Um, you know, just let them put their finger in their ear um, because that's basically, you know, you, you are walking the street and you have this loud noise there. Um, there isn't anything that one could do, and um, that has been not so much a problem for, um, for the public, but actually it used to be a problem many years ago with the people inside the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And now they have designed ambulances and so on, so that inside they don't hear the, the, the noise as, as loudly as, as previously. But I think that there was, um, and there have been studies showing that ambulance drivers in the past certainly would get um, um, mm -hmm. noise-induced hearing loss. Yeah. And I just want to go back to the other caller with the bar, who's exposed to all the noise. I mean, of course, if there are legal things, you're getting no success with the legal thing. The other thing is you can soundproof your house, but that's going to be very expensive. But there are techniques and structural things that you can put in to really minimize the sound coming in. Um, I, will ha I have another caller on the line. Hello, good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, Hi, go ahead. Yes, uh, look, I, uh, in the house there, the, I was around 10 or 15 years, anywhere around there when I started to feel a little dizzy. Mm -hmm. uh, one morning I got up and I started to throw up on whatever it is and think, thinking, well, maybe I was feeling a little bad. When I realized that a sound was coming from my ears, I write it. Uh, it built up a pressure and after a little while I went to a doctor. Dr. Shredar is my doctor also. Uh, for many years I went to the hospital. I did x-ray, we did tests, we did all sort of sound prevention thing. And I, we had a lot of problem with my ears and after... No, I'm a pensioner, and I still get this this air this air that build up in my this pressure that build up in my air. And when that happens, I cannot move. I have to stay very still. I sweat a lot, and um, right now I'm 90% deaf in my right ear. Um, I don't know what to do again because I've tried every single thing and anything that anyone told me that I should do, I did. Doctor Trainer, as I told you, he um, he saw me on many occasions and he recommended a lot of different uh, medication and I did what I did. At one point he told me about the um, inner part of the air and um, I, I did, he told me about the how it's tape and whatever it is. I can't call the name that he told me about it now but I did every single thing and still at this age as a pensioner I still feel dizzy, I still have this pressure that still build up in my air and when there's noise, uh, uh, sometimes for days, and um, it's like something blowing out of the air, and um, mm -hmm. I cannot hear with it. And it's a lot of problem that I really have. And the hardest thing is that I cannot move when that is taking place because um, it makes it make you feel dizzy, like you know, giddy. Yeah. Um, sweat a lot and whatever it is. I don't know if new studies or you have All any. Right, yep. uh, if you all could solve that problem yeah. for me, I mean, all right. before, if you could take quite a visit also. All right. Thanks very much for calling. Um, we're kind of muttering here. I think we have a consensus on probably what is going on with you, uh, Austin. 
Well, I, th I think he sounds like he has Meniere's disease. All right, so tell us uh, what Meniere's disease is. Meniere's disease is, um, well, classically it has three symptoms which are very common, but there's a fourth one that we've added, and he has all four of them from what I hear. That's the ringing in the ears, the dizziness, the feeling of a pressure buildup in the ear, and hearing loss. Um, nobody's quite sure what is the cause of many ears. Every year there's a different uh, theory that comes out as to what causes it. It used to be viral, and then it's autoimmune. Um, so, but the, the, uh, the bottom line is that it cannot be cured. It can be treated, it can be managed, and typically it, uh, when it first starts, it, it's pretty bad, especially the dizziness and the ringing in the ears. And then it uh, kind of plateaus off. It reaches a, a level where it levels off, and you can go for months and sometimes years without any symptoms, and then suddenly it hits you out of the blue. Uh, the basis of treatment is basically a low salt diet. Um, and I'm pretty sure at some stage we had told you about that, that you have to cut out salt in your diet. Uh, that is really the only treatment. There are hundreds of medications available for this, this thing. None of them really works. Yeah, so the, uh, as Dr. Trenda is saying, we know salt contributes, caffeine, smoking, but what happens is stress can also bring it on as well. Um, one of the problems with especially patients who are having spinning, that's called vertigo, is that why Dr. Trenda said we can't tell you definitely a lot of the time what's causing it, because really the only way we can tell you is to cut open your head and look at it, and we can't do that. Mm -hmm. So we work on what the, the research has shown us and what works and what doesn't work. So if you're getting that dizziness once a year or once every two years, I think you're doing well. The question about the hearing loss, if the hearing loss is significant, yes, a hearing aid from Dretchy <laughs> can be helpful sometimes. But believe it or not, if it's really debilitating, even more technical things like cochlear implants and stuff can be considered. But yes, um, the ultimate thing that um, can be done is actually surgical destruction of the inner ear, which is really a last resort. So um, it's unfortunate, but this is what God has handed you. Uh, you need to, as Dr. Trinidad said, listen to the, thing, the advice, and, and you can live around it. You can, once you have an MRI scan, making sure that there's no, uh, nothing inside the brain that could be contributing to it, you can live a good quality of life. And it seems that you have You've, you've gone along in age and you're still surviving and you're having, uh, I'm sure, a family and stuff, and, and you can live a good life, but sometimes it's difficult to cure it as such. All right, we have another caller. Hello, good night. Hello, good night, Dr. Enderhouse. Hi, you're on the air, go ahead. Okay, good night to everyone. Hi. Hi. I'm a concerned parent, I have a son, and he had, about two weeks ago, he had business for five days straight. How old is he? He is 34. No, his son, your son is how old? 34. 34, all right. Yes, and he was using chemical. Sometimes he's driving, and when he's in his taken, his wife has to take, take over driving. Is, I, I'm a bit concerned. Should he see so, a doctor? Or so was that his be? first attack of dizziness? What is that? Was that his first attack? No, 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 no. He had it before. All right. He had it before. All right. A, a, a long while ago. All right, let's go on to Dr. Pinda, and she'll tell you if she, he goes to her, what she would do. Um, really? Uh, so, as Dr. Juman said, um, the symptom there is a symptom of vertigo. And again, it's a symptom, and one would have to take a history and examination to see exactly what the problem is. Um, once you do a history and examination, you may need some investigations. And depending on what those investigations are, then, you know, a diagnosis will be made and um, management. But it's very difficult to say um, what is the cause of vertigo um, just, just as so a symptom. So maybe you could just say about the few common causes that we right. would see. Right. So the common causes, especially if it is, it, what we usually do is we define vertigo often by its length and its behavior. 
So for example, we have common courses of vertigo that will just last a few seconds. That will be benign positional vertigo. And that's, for example, you put your head in a particular position and you may get a little spinning for a few seconds. Um, that is usually very easily treatable within a doctor's office. Um, other causes, as Dr. Trinidad said, many is disease. Um, there are other issues where, for example, you can have abnormalities. Something like a viral illness can attack the inner air. Um, immune problems can attack the inner air. Um, problems, vascular problems with the blood vessel supply to the inner air can, can attack the inner air and you can produce um, vertigo or this dizziness. Um, so there are um, you know, <coughs> abnormalities of the nerve of hearing as well. Um, that is a rare cause. So there are several causes of vertigo, but one has to be sure, the doctor has to examine and make sure it is vertigo. Because a lot of people will say, oh, they have dizziness, and it may not be vertigo. And as I think vertigo is explained before. No, tell them so tell vertigo them. is just a sensation of movement between yourself and your environment when no such movement exists. In other words, I could be sitting here, but I'm feeling the room moving or the room spinning or I'm feeling my head spinning and of course my head is not spinning. So one has to, to make sure that the person is talking about vertigo and not other complaints. So a lot of people would complain that they have dizziness and it's really a lightheaded feeling and so on. So those are the sorts of things that one would have to do um, when you're looking at vertigo. So to the mom there, I, I certainly share your concern. A 34-year-old who has five days of vertigo um, def definitely needs to see a doctor, needs to be investigated. Um, that may be hearing testing, that may be blood investigations, that may be an MRI scan, and assess what is going on. I would say in the majority of cases, we can offer some help to, to vertigo in one way or the other or at least make a diagnosis. Um, however, there are some cases where it could be, just to get a little technical, something from within the brain, um, where the brain itself is not functioning. So certainly I agree, he should go and see a doctor, he should better assess, and let's see how we can help him in some way. <clears throat> um, we have another caller on the line. <clears throat> Do we have any more callers? I think it's time to wrap up. Um, now, Ms. Ms. Um, Kashiba, I, I, I certainly I, I, I admire what you have done, that your son developed a hearing issue. And instead of... Uh, <laughs> um, mourning. Instead of mourning and groaning, you got involved. And I, I like that. I like that. You have, you have, you're part of the solution. And, uh, and I, I think... In terms of what, what your vision, what do you see uh, happening in the future as far as the... The organization or for that... Well, organization to start with. Um, well, I know with the association of itself, um, it would develop and grow to be more deaf friendly because right now, though we work with four of the deaf, um, we have to understand deafness more as an organization and, and become a little more deaf friendly. Sign language is very important for us right now because um, most of the deaf that we know use the sign language as their first language, so we have to promote a lot more of that. Um, for the general organization and our testing and all that, we want to improve on that aspect of it as well so that the organization of itself would be that kind of like a mecca because the Caribbean don't really have anything like dretchy. And we want to show that example of this is what it can be and this is what we can do and mm -hmm. set up, you know, other dretchies across the Caribbean so we could see what that's like. That's great. I think we have another caller on the line. Hello, good evening. Uh, I think they hang up. So, I mean, the, the thing that's going to make that a reality, I suppose, a lot more commitment and a lot more funding. Um, well, commitment definitely from the board of directors, from the persons who we have working internally in the organization as well. Because as an NGO, um, we need staff who are committed and dedicated to the organization and what we're doing and not individuals. Your dedication is to a person, no. Um, so we're hoping that as we go along that development and that improvement can grow. And we're starting actually now. Uh, we have people like Dr. Pinder, who is there from since when, and she continues to support. And I know you guys support as well on various levels. And I think that's really amazing. Um, so as we continue, I guess I might be 
getting into your support a little more. Um, but as we continue, I know the association is going to develop to be a better place. Oh, great. Thanks very much. I mean, the people behind it, like you, I have great confidence that it will thanks, achieve thanks. what it needs to achieve. Um, Debbie? Yes. Um, in terms of... Final comments? Okay. Um, well, again, we just want to plug on, and I think I would like to really see, commend, um, the Trinidad Tobago Society of Otolaryngologists and Head and Neck Surgeons because individually members have both individually and collectively been sounding you know the alarm and us and trying to sensitize the population over the years um, individual audiologists have been doing the same I want to commend the Trinidad Tobago Association for the Hearing Impaired for bringing on this campaign that we can all work together because we are seeing the same thing. So I really want to thank um, the Trinidad and Tobago Association for the Hearing Impaired to bring this campaign on as well as the Trinidad and Tobago Society of Otolaryngologists for supporting it and all the other um, stakeholders who are supporting this. Um, and really we want to do these things. We want to prevent hearing since, loss. Since I'm in the mood for commendation, I would like to point you out, point out to the folks out there, your role in championing and actually activating this whole thing about the health screening, hearing screening in schools. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, um, the Ministry of Health actually started hearing, uh, um, hearing screening of all primary school entrants in 2005. That continues. But we don't just screen entrants. We screen every child and any child that the school has concerns um, about the hearing. Um, we, screen a lot, we screen that child, and when, if that child does not pass screening, the child is referred to a health center, um, and the doctor examines the child, makes sure there's no medical problem. If there is, he treats or she treats, and then children are, um, can go to Drechi if they're in the north, and they go to San Fernando General Hospital, which is the only public health facility with audiological facilities, and I want to commend Dr. Trinidad and Dr. Medford and all the others who have championed that. Um, it still is the only public hospital with audiological facilities. So the, Which those, is sad, isn't it? It is very sad. <laughs> it is very sad. And, you know, it's, we are hoping that we would improve and, you know, we would get these facilities. However, Drechi has really, you know, stepped up yeah. and they really um, do the testing and the Ministry of Health has contractual arrangements with Trinidad and Tobago Association for the Hearing Paired where we pay. So once you are a child attending a school, we, the Ministry of Health will pay for your testing at Drechi. So the child does not have to pay and we also provide free hearing aids. We pay Drechi to give your child hearing aids if the child needs hearing aids. And Dr. Trinidad, um uh, certainly, before you, you wrap up, I'd like to thank you for being a mentor for probably most of the ENT surgeons in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, any final comments? Yes. Um, well, I would like people to be more cognizant of the fact that noise gets in your ears and damages them, damages them for good. Um, that you can protect, you can stop this from happening. And when you think of people like steel bandsmen and, and, and so on, and rock musicians uh, who have lost their hearing from exposure, chronic exposure to sound, loud sounds. And these are the most productive, you know, artistic people, and they're going to be losing their hearing. You know, not, not everyone can be a Beethoven and mm -hmm. produce masterpieces while you're deaf. So, you know, protect your hearing, please. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Ms. Kashiba Lafleur, Dr. Debbie Pinder, Dr. Austin Trinidad for being my guest on tonight's show. And certainly I, the information that we've gotten and the calls have raised some very important points. And I hope you found them truly useful. As usual, before we close tonight's show, I'd like, you all, I'd like to give you all a little quotation to kind of think for the rest of the week. And uh, there was a very interesting quotation. Don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my producers and my special guests, 
I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to Channel 8 IBN. Um, hopefully what the information that we've given you will have the quality of life that you can live and who knows, the life you save could be your own. Until we meet again in one week's time on Channel 8 at 8 p.m. on Doctor in the House, I wish you all good night and assalamu alaikum.